Hello, Chart Watchers, and welcome to this Tuesday, December 18th, Market Watchers Live show with your hosts, Tom Boley and Aaron Swinlin. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome to the show, and for our regulars, welcome back. Well, one day after closing below its uh, February low, the S&P 500 and all the major indices trying to bounce back. Got the uh, Dow Jones currently up 238 points, the S&P 500 up 14, the NASDAQ up 46, the Russell 2000 up 7. Ten-year Treasury yield, however, continues to move lower, back down at 2.83%, testing multi-month lows. We'll see whether or not the 2.81-2.82% uh, area holds. Volatility index, 25.23 is the highest close that we've seen since back at that fe February low. And I know yesterday we had gotten up above that level, as you can see. We didn't make the close above that. But we're currently at 2492, not too far away. So if the market turns south again later today, you'll want to watch that volatility index. A breakout there would not be good. Uh, certainly could be indicative of more impulsive selling to come. Real estate definitely leading today. But look at the day it had yesterday. Broke down. This was one of the strongest areas of the market. And now all of a sudden with that move yesterday, it is in more of a technical sell position, which is not good for the market because there are a lot of technical uh, traders out there. And it seems like more and more areas of the market are turning on to technical sell signals. Leading to the downside today, you've got energy. You can see clearly moving lower. Crude oil prices just tumbling down another 5% today, just above $47 a barrel. And that has a number of energy stocks lower. Boeing, best performer in the S&P 500. Uh, today, they did uh, raise their repurchase. Um, I think their share repurchase amount was 18 billion they ra they raised it to 20 billion i believe and you can see pretty positive reaction there but the overall downtrend still in play darden restaurants reported earnings i think this little bounce today it is the best performer in the s p 500 or it was just a few minutes ago um, but this move here looks very suspect to me we'll talk about that in a minute oracle had a great report beat on top line beat on bottom line nice reaction higher at the open but then the selling came, barely holding on to a gain after a solid report, not a good sign. And FactSet Research, FDS, also reported earnings today. Stock gapped up earlier today, under a lot of pressure, though now trading down near the low of the day. Oh, wow, Heron. Uh, I don't know. Yesterday, you know, I've been talking about that 2581 level holding on the S&P. Well, it didn't hold. Uh, 2546 or whatever the close was yesterday, not good. I think this bounce looks kind of weak so far today. We'll see how we finish. So it can uh, mark you in the bear market column now? 95%. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was 90 over the weekend. Now I'm 95. Yes. Yes. Uh, I, I do like this bounce. I think this might be a, a good opportunity to get out of my longs. So I'll be watching it pretty closely because uh, I agree with you. The, the market action's bad. I mean, I've been... Uh, having problems with it for a while and you know uh, somebody asked me what it means to sell into strength that means when the market's going up that's your opportunity to get rid of those longs and those <laughs> those items that you don't want to be holding if you suspect uh, the market will be declining so hoping we'll see a little strength into the holiday that's that's my hope yeah and it's really just uh you know selling into strength is one of those strategies uh, in a bear market, not so much in a bull market. A lot of folks want to hold on and ride. Exactly. Down. But yeah, in a bear market, it's uh, the opposite. You just turn your computer monitor upside down because <laughs> exactly every one of those moves to the downside, uh, usually followed by a very weak rally. And that's generally a time to be thinking about getting out of any longs you have. Um, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, it's I uh, probably need to do a reprise of my bull and bear market rules uh, workshop. I might put that one together for my next one. Yeah, no doubt. All right, we got a lot going. I know you're going to have a workshop later on some of the basics of technical analysis. And I got to tell you, you know, I'm, my background was as a um, fundamental person. I'm a CPA. And so I was always, you know, doing audits and going through a lot of the um, uh, different, uh, uh, you know, financial stuff um, and fundamental side. But I, I convinced myself a long time ago that it's much better to have the technical side and I know you got some of that coming up but what else we got going all right well as far as the upcoming schedule tomorrow we have Danielle Shea uh, simp 
simple trader, simply trading, I think, dot com. I, I will look that up for everybody and put it in the blog. Julius de Campanar will be with us on Thursday, Mr. RRG. Mary Ellen will be back for what's hot, what's not on Friday. And then I know everybody's going to go into morning, but we will not have any live shows. Friday is going to be our last one until the new year. So, uh, you know, take a break. We're going to take a break at least from the the broadcasting part, Tom. I know we're still going to be out in the background, though. <laughs> Today, uh, yes, building blocks of technical analysis. I'll get into that. Uh, Tom and I will both do the 10 and 10. I will give him the symbols that you put in the chat room. Our first one is going to be U.S. natural gas. It's had some pretty interesting uh, chart patterns going on there. And then Tom's going to finish it off with stocks to watch. So stick around for that. But uh, let's go ahead and get started, and I'm going to get my uh, presentation all ready. Sounds good. All right, well, let's start off with the key economic reports out this morning. Really, it was all about housing. We had the November housing starts number out and uh, November building permits. You can see there on your screen, very strong numbers on both, so uh, nice beat. Uh, we talked about how these uh, the home construction stocks tend to do pretty well in the uh, December, January, February time frame, which you wouldn't think from a common sense perspective. Uh, these are times of the month, especially on the East Coast, where you get a lot of uh, nasty weather. So you wouldn't think home construction would be, uh, you know, performing well in the winter months. But uh, historically, they do. And maybe, again, market looks ahead. So that could be some anticipation of what's expected uh, come springtime. Uh, not sure that's going to be a good thing, though, with the way the market's been going. But we'll, we'll see. Anyway, the, the numbers, as you can see on your screen, came out pretty strong. Let's take a look at what's going on in terms of the reaction in the treasury market. Not much. And this has been the problem really for the past five or six weeks. Uh, even when we've gotten good economic data, which normally would send traders scurrying out of treasuries and see in the yield rising, that has not been happening. And this has been pretty consistent. Like I said, five, six weeks where the yield just continues to drop. It means money is rotating into treasuries, which means the market is anticipating uh, economic weakness ahead, or at least is not not as much strength as was previously anticipated. So uh, we got a big Fed meeting starts tomorrow. I think it's just a one day meeting. I believe they meet tomorrow, report, um, you know, come out with their announcement tomorrow. Most of the meetings are two day meetings, but I believe this one is only one. So uh, I think everyone is going to have bated breath, you know, just sitting back waiting on Fed Chair Jerome Powell and what he has to say. I'll be honest, I think he's in a box. I think the way the market's acting right now, it's not going to matter what he says. Uh, I think if he comes out and says that, um, even if he were to, I think everybody's expecting that he's going to raise one more time and that maybe the language will change for 2018, or excuse me, for 2019. But I think even if he threw a curveball and said we're not raising right now, I think that would that could potentially send the market into a tailspin because essentially the Fed would be saying, exactly what the market has been telling us, and that is that things are slowing down. And so I'm not sure that the Fed, I, I don't know. I just don't think there's, that they have any, any cards to play right now that are necessarily going to save the market. I think the first thing that would help, in my opinion, would be the trade war being resolved. But anyhow, uh, everyone is going to be following this uh, a Fed announcement tomorrow very closely. It will be announced, um, I'm fairly certain, 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Eastern Standard Time, of course. Okay, let's take a look at the earnings reports. Uh, believe it or not, I know we're getting close to the holidays, but there were a number of reports out last night and this morning. You can see on your screen, Oracle, really nice report. Not only did, uh, did we see a beat there on the bottom line, as you can see, but Oracle also posted really nice numbers on the top line, beating by about a half percent, which is pretty good. 9.57 billion versus 9.52 billion. Then you can see Red Hat beating on the bottom line, but they missed on their revenues. Uh, Heiko Corp uh, matched on their bottom line. They beat on their top line. And then you've got Darden Restaurants matching on the bottom line, missing on the top line. And that was one that was up earlier. I was saying, um, I'm not sure it's going to hold. We'll look at that chart in just a second. And then facts at uh, data research, you can see uh, posting pretty good number top and bottom line. But that report also has resulted in a pretty big move to the downside. So let's take a look first at Oracle and uh, take a look at it on a relative chart so you can see how it's doing relative to some of its peers. Here was the big gap up. 
We had just recently broken down below some support in the 46 and a half, 47 area. So the gap up above 48 today was really constructive, I thought, technically. But it was right at the 50 day and we've seen mostly selling since. Now we went all the way back down below yesterday's close and now we're starting to rally. So we filled the gap. I think today's close will say a lot on Oracle. If we go back down close near the low, I would suspect we're probably heading back down toward the June lows. If we can hold here and eventually move back up through the 50 day, then I think it brings the recent highs into play. So Oracle, even after the report, a solid report at best, I see kind of a mixed or neutral kind of a, a chart here. When we look at Oracle relative to the software stocks, you can see we've been under pressure for quite some time. And even with its earnings report, got a little bit of a pop on a relative basis, but not, not much. So the group overall has been doing better than Oracle. So when I look at this, they've come out with their earnings. Earnings were good, but the market's reaction pretty tepid. I think there are other software stocks out there look a little bit better. Moving on to Red Hat, another software stock. Uh, you can see Red Hat. Uh, that was the, the big gap up here was the announcement by IBM that they were going to acquire Red Hat. So I think that uh, as far as the performance of the chart goes, I think you're really looking at what's going on with IBM. I believe it was Arthur Hill just had a, a really good article about IBM. I'll pull that chart up uh, so we can take a look here. Um, since that uh, November acquisition, saw a little bit of movement to the upside. It's coming back down. But the overall trend, I mean, this to me, to me looks like a bear flag. And I think that was kind of what uh, Arthur was pointing out. So IBM not looking good. Keep in mind Red Hat being acquired by IBM. HEI. HEI breakdown before earnings. Got a nice report. Beat on the top line. Bottom line just matched, though. We're getting up to the 20-day, but so far failing. And I'm going to be very cautious, these stocks that fail at the 20-day moving average, because if we are, in fact, and I believe we are, if we are, in fact, going to be looking at a bear market in 2019, we want to be real careful when we get these rallies up to key technical levels like the declining 20-day moving average. Darden Restaurants, one of the top performers in the S&P. I think GE might have passed it today. We'll take a look at that in just a second. Up five and a quarter percent, but uh, I think the stock has rolled over. This was the earnings report back in September. We had a nice gap up, pulled back, held on to this price support, remember, uh, I think this may have been one of my setups back when it was down near this support area and had a nice rally. Uh, but since then, it has now come down, taken out this support level, went back all the way into this gap support area, and now trying to bounce. But it's got a weak PPO. Again, watch that 20-day moving average. I'll be surprised if we get through. FDS, which is fact set, fact set data. Uh, here was the one that beat on the top line, beat on the bottom line. Stock's down 3.75% threatening a pretty significant breakdown. Support has been holding around 210. We got down to 208.53. And now we'll see whether or not we can hold it into the close. But look at the volume picking up on all of the selling. I don't know. It doesn't look very good to me. Uh, a couple of companies reporting after the bell today. FDX. This is FedEx. Look at what's been going on in transportation stocks. These transportation services, uh, freight companies. Uh, FedEx not performing well. I I don't know what's going to happen with their last quarter, but I have a feeling that their guidance is not going to be very good based on what we are seeing here with all of this heavy volume selling. Micron. Well, this is another one. This has been one of the weaker semiconductor stocks. You can see we've got triple bottom, kind of a descending triangle in play on uh, on Micron. So I'd be careful here, $34.00. Pretty important support, maybe 33.75 to 34. I suspect we're not going to have a very good report, but it's been hurt. It's been hit so hard. We might get a, a a relief rally if the report isn't that bad. But I don't think it will see over forty dollars. That seems to be the area that I would be watching on any kind of a bounce. And then finally, Jabil Circuits, uh, JBL, been uh, moving lower, trading at new lows. Uh, this is another one coming out with uh, their earnings after the bell today. I don't know. Not looking very good. I don't suspect they're going to have very good uh, report, but maybe uh, a lot of it's already built in. So perhaps another relief rally here. Watch that 20-day moving average to the upside. Okay, let's move on and talk about a few things here. Crude oil. Um, it, I don't think it's going to show up on this particular chart, but it is down 5% from these levels. Look at the move from October. $77 a barrel down to 50. We're now at 47.25 or something. 
as of 15 minutes ago. And so you can see a very significant breakdown in crude oil. That is not good. When we look at the S&P 500, kept talking and talking about 2581. Actually, for a while, I was talking about 2582, and then I realized I was one off. So sorry about that. But this uh, close back here was 2581 in February. We had not seen a close below that level until yesterday. I will say this, though. Um, and again, I think the odds are getting less and less that we are going to break out of this correction and move back higher. I think it's going to evolve into a bear market. But let's go back a few years here. And I just want to give you the 5% hope that I'm still holding out. Actually, this isn't far enough back. I want to go back into that 2014 area. Okay, so here was the initial low in the correction, in my opinion, that started back in 2014. Had this move down, went to higher highs, came back down, back up again, and then came all the way back down and went just slightly below that prior low and then rallied, put in a double bottom. Uh, I The problem I have here is I think this was the double bottom. We went up, hit the 50. You could see the PPO had returned to the center line, and now we're beginning to accelerate again back to the downside. So I think we got a little bit of a problem here with the S&P. But if you want to hold out hope, that low over here was 25.31 and change. Yesterday's low, 25.30 and change. So if you're somebody who follows intraday lows, I tend to follow the closing lows. I can tell you that we did have a break of closing support back here. But essentially, we went a little bit below the intraday support, but that was the bottom of that correction. So... I'm leaning bearish, but I will tell you, I was writing bearish articles back here in February and had to eat crow uh, when the market turned back to the upside. So, uh, again, I'll, I'll hold out some hope for the market, but it really needs to turn soon. And outside of China, U.S. trade, I'm not sure what the catalyst is going to be right here. A lot of things turning south. All right, uh, let's take a look at some upgrades and downgrades quickly. First, uh, on the upgrade side, NSC. This is a railroad, Norfolk Southern. I mentioned in my blog today, railroads breaking down or on the verge. I think we got to be careful here with Norfolk Southern. We did break below the October lows and any kind of a test back up here around 155 or close to that 20 day moving average, which is declining. I would be careful. Uh, Fortive FTV was also upgraded today. You can see after getting a 50 day test and testing resistance, we have now moved to new lows. So we've got this pattern now, lower, low, lower, high, lower, low which is beginning, it's upgraded. I think it's an opportunity to sell, especially again, if it gets back up that 20 day. Um, then we've got on the downgrade side, FlowServe, FLS, welcome to the party. I don't remember who downgraded it, but of course the stock's been selling off quite some time. September, it was $57 a share, or almost 57, now it's at 40. Someone downgraded it today. And as a result, you can see the stock is down, probably getting oversold. I would expect a bounce, but anything back up around 43, 44 probably will be met with more sellers. Illinois Toolworks downgraded ITW. Another stock set a uh, reaction low. We're trading in the middle of it, but the overall downward action in the overall market tells me we're probably going to head back toward this low. And you can see we are taking out these prior lows from a week or two ago. Not looking good here for Illinois Toolworks. And then the final downgrade is WorldPay, WP. You can see also downtrending. Coming back down close to price support. If we pull this one up on a relative chart, you will see, first of all, it is part of that software space. But because it has fallen so far down below all these other lows, whereas the group hasn't, you've got a stock now that is breaking to new relative lows versus its peers. Not a good sign. Not a good look on the chart. Uh, this is one I would be avoiding for sure. All right, let's go ahead and just do a quick summary of those upgrades and downgrades. You can see a number of stocks that were upgraded and downgraded that I did not cover. And uh, maybe one to mention there was just the uh, downgrade of uh, KSU, which is also a railroad. So we got one, up, one uh, railroad being upgraded, another one being downgraded, and the overall group breaking down yesterday, or at least on the verge of a breakdown. So I don't know. thought that was kind of interesting. But Aaron, I know it is time for your workshop and uh, you got some basic stuff stuff yes. out there. What you got? All right. So uh, I am going to give credit where credit is due. Uh, I have a very nice gentleman who sits next to me in my season seats named James. And I told him what I did. And he was very interested 
and seeing it and learning it. And so he started listening to the show and he's like, I am just so lost. And he gave, he gave me, I said, okay, well, give me a list of the things that, that are troubling you, that you, you're not so sure about. And I'll try and put all of that into a, uh, you know, a beginner workshop. Uh, of course, as I went through his list, <laughs> I looked at all the things that I felt like I needed to cover. This is really going to be part one. I think there are plenty of part twos and part three, but today I'm just going to go really basic. And I know a lot of you have been studying technical analysis for some time, um, but I, I think you will also, um, I think you'll do pretty well with this. I think you'll enjoy it. So. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. And James, thank you for the, for the suggestion. All right, so what I'm gonna cover, and like I said, it'll be very basic, but I think everybody can always use a review. Uh, so what I, I'm gonna cover are price bars and time frames. you know, the basics on a, a chart. What are you looking at? I'll look at moving averages, just a quick explanation of those and how they're helpful. Uh, one of the important parts of technical analysis, of course, that we do all the time is drawing support resistance lines and then also trend lines. And then of course, me, who's crazy about chart patterns, uh, I could go on and on about chart patterns, but I will show you some of the basics. And then at the end, I'll just cover a few of the basic indicators. Um, to be honest, the ones that I like to use, so I'll cover those and uh, we'll see how far we get through here. Uh, but let's go ahead and, and start, start the, doing what we need to do here. All right, so what are the, what's the difference anyway between technical analysis and fundamental analysis? We always talk about the two of them as separate entities and they, they really are separate, but there are lots of overlap between technical and fundamental analysis. So really technical analysis, this is why the math majors, the, you know, those of us who like uh, the math and the charts and the visuals, it's really your forecasting price movements based on just what you're seeing in a chart from, from what past price, price movements are. So if you're, I guess if you wanna say a technical purist, uh, you would say that everything is baked into the chart, everything. Uh, but a lot of us, uh, I am on that side to some degree, but uh, there also is important uh, fundamental analysis that I do include. And that is, you know, you have to look at what are the underlying forces. So we want to know what the Fed's doing. We want to know which sectors are doing well. We want to know what industry groups are doing well. And all of that really does come under the umbrella of fundamental analysis. So here are a few presentations of price. Uh, basically, uh, when you look at an OHLC bar, the one on the left, well, first of all, that's the low for the day, and this is the high for the day. And then the open is on the left side of that vertical, and the close is on the right. And so we can look at the difference between the open and close on this. We can also see, obviously, what the intraday high and lows are. Uh, there are various ways you can plot these on your chart. You can set it up so you get red ones when the close is lower the next day. Um, you know, various ways to do that. And of course, there's the solid line chart, but most of us don't use that uh, because we want that extra information that you can get from the bars and the candlesticks. <clears throat> I am not gonna get way into candlesticks at all. Uh, I don't follow them. They're very short-term chart patterns, really uh, to a day or two, uh, depending. You know, you're, basically they tell you about what to expect like the next day. So they're like a really fast chart pattern. And while I think those are great, my trading style, I just don't need to have a candlestick because everything is in the OHLC bar for me because I don't need to know exactly what happened versus the next day. And here you can see how the, the candles are set up in, in basic uh, language, just like the OHLC bar. You've got the high, of course, at the top of the wick and then on the bottom here, uh, you have the low, obviously for the intraday high and low. Then you have your open and close, just like we did here only with the candlestick, you make it a box, uh, you make it a candle. The difference between whether it's black, uh, red, 
um, hollow and all of that. I put that on here uh, just so you can, it, it's just basically a matter of, okay, where is the close to the prior close? Where's the close to the open and uh, that sort of thing. I don't wanna get into it because I have so much more to cover, but uh, you can find all of this in chart school. And I mean, all of this, I, I actually just took these uh, charts right out of chart school. So there you are. Then there are the time frames. I'll get to the charts in a moment. So then there are the time frames. Everybody's like, well, what does long term mean? What does actually short term mean? Well, I'll be honest, it, it does mean different things to different analysts. Uh, but typically, we all can agree that long term time frame, you take typically want to look at a monthly or even an annual chart. Intermediate term, you're looking more at those weekly charts. Short term, daily charts, ultra short term to me, day trader, that sort of thing. If you're really trading during the day, hourly and of course, minute charts. So typically I stay in the daily charts. However, I, I find intermediate term information on the daily charts. So, so I consider daily charts useful for both. Uh, and as far as long term and, and uh, intermediate term, of course, I do think of the weekly charts as intermediate term, but sometimes the chart patterns and the trends on those weekly charts really translate also to the monthly chart, meaning it's also a long term presentation for you to look at. All right, so let's go ahead. I'm going to look at a few charts for you here, just so we can get through there. Okay, so chart school, you can find it right here at that tab. And you know, you can type in whatever you're interested in. But honestly, uh, for what I'm covering today, lots of that is right here under chart analysis. And then when you want to get a little bit more into the to the weeds, uh, a little bit more advanced, you of course can really get in and look at those indicators and overlays and all of that. But again, I'm going to be very basic today. So so let's go ahead and we'll start. We, I, Tom was talking about Oracle, so I figured, OK, well, we'll look at Oracle. Uh, so we're looking at the price part. I want to look at the price chart. Part hey, Aaron. Yes. I'm still seeing your slide. Oh, OK. I must have not shared the right thing. My bad. Perfect. There you go. All right. Excellent. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and make the um, price a little bit bigger since that's really all I want to pay attention to here. So I think I have one. Yes, this works good. All right. So what I'm first going to talk about is support and resistance. And, uh, you know, for a lot of us, we think of it as just so basic and, you know, it's second nature. And it really isn't that hard to come up with. Uh, you know, really, when it comes to trend lines and support and resistance, you want to get as many touches on the line. Uh, so let's go ahead. I'm going to take it to an annotation tool. And we're going to determine where our price support and resistance are on this chart. Uh, the excellent tool for this is using that auto support and resistance line because it gives you that long, uh, it tells you when the price is above it, price is below it. Let's make it big and thick so we can see it better. There we go. So you can see when you use that auto support, you can uh, take a peek here. There's little red bars in here. That means the price, the close was below it, uh, that support line. So if you, you can use it, actually use it and drag it to the point where you're not really seeing any of those little red lines. So to me, in this case, I would be looking at my price support at 4650. And why would that be? Well, number one, I find that price support and resistance typically land on those, um, I would, I don't know if I want to say even numbers, but I guess, guess so. Usually you're going to have that, you know, like in this case, we are doing it in terms of 50 cents on each one. Typically people have a memory like a, a psychology about their trades because you think about well if it gets to 50 i'm gonna sell it if it i bought it at 45 so you're thinking about that you remember that and all of the investors also remember that and so that's where a lot of times you're going to see um, a consensus of price support on these lines here on the horizontals that usually match up with a, a like an even number. So in this case, 
the support level I figure is 4650. Uh, that touches here, these two October lows it matches. It touches this low from back in August. And if you come back here, uh, it looks like it even matches a gap that's that's coming in over here. Uh, now, where it, where's your resistance? So that's the support. That's where um, you want price to stop and then bounce. Uh, well, that didn't happen yesterday, nor is it happening today. Um, that's a problem. You know, you want to know that that price support has been broken. So now the people who um, had this 4650 in mind now have it's all the way gotten all the way down to 4550 and now that's when you're going to start to see some more selling and typically that's why we look at the support lines because when it's broken uh, typically you're going to see of course a continuation to the downside when you break down uh, on that price support so this one i would say is is a uh, short term to intermediate term price support line now where where do we figure the resistance is well uh, again i look at those areas where it's usually an even number or I look where the price tops are. The easy one, of course, would be where your highest one is on the chart, the highest uh, level. And that's, you know, typically an, an easy way to come up with resistance. But let's face it, that's a long way up. So where else can I look for a possible um, price resistance here? I think there's a few of them. Uh, first, I would look at this level here because I can see twice that was really a stopping point back in the summer in July and August. So I'm gonna just draw that in based on just those. And then I'm gonna look at where that comes up. All right. I think that's a pretty decent resistance line. Uh, it comes up, you can see it actually matches up with this gap. All right. And gaps are points in time where there is no trading activity within that price range. So you'll get, for example, an intraday move. It'll open much higher, en enough higher that it's higher than the previous intraday high. And so you'll get these gaps in trading. And that's, you can generally find support and resistance at those gaps. We always talk about gap support and gap resistance. So in this case, I think you can, can use this as a shorter term resistance line. You've got a touch back here in October. You've got these two touches back here. You could even think of it as a zone. Uh, a lot of times I will make a support and resistance zone. I'll make it more uh, opaque and you can do it that way. Or if you just want to draw like a rectangle to give you yeah, that zone of support and resistance, there's a zone because that matches up with this top. It's matching up with this top. So you know that in this zone likely is going to be some resistance on price. And it looks like today we got to that intraday high, uh, didn't quite make it to 48.50. Uh, so now we're starting to head back down and below this support level. And that's not good news. All right, let me clear these because now I want to show you a few trend lines. Actually, I'm going to take this to a longer term chart because I, I think that'll be more interesting. All right, so let's go to our regular market watchers chart, <clears throat> chart style. All right, uh, <laughs> and I've got too many indicators in here, so we'll take some of those off. Uh, but typically, I'll, I'll go through those indicators, the basics that I like to use, just so you know. Okay, so we'll just take those two out. That'll give us a bigger price price. Uh, window. All right, so what about uh, trend lines? And actually, now that we have a longer term picture here, I'll look at those support and resistance lines one more time. Okay, so we are going to do the auto support and resistance. I think I had what 4850 was the area that zone. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it matches this low here, these two lows in the zone, but I, I would be more interested in the fact that this is where it stopped, like we were seeing on that previous chart, as possible resistance. And again, there is that gap. Move it up to that intraday low for that gap. And that matches up nicely with uh, this gap, doesn't it? You'll find that, like I said, it, <clears throat> that'll happen just because um, it's not like muscle memory, but it's a psychological uh, trading memory. And there's 4650 was the other one I was looking at from these lows. And that actually comes pretty close to this high. It's close to this low. <clears throat> we got a breakdown. It was support previously back here in the end of 2017. So really, that's how you're going to find your support and resistance lines. And according to uh, Greg Morris, 
uh, those are the only lines on a chart that matter. Um, I, I understand what he's saying because trading wise that it really is where the rubber meets the road, I guess. Uh, the trend lines really are there for identifying what the trend actually is. And when you do that, you only will draw declining tops or rising bottoms. And why is that? Well, that's how you're gonna really see where the trend is going, where you're, uh, if you wanna look at it as um, where the price trend could be broken, like a sort of like a support being broken. So uh, I just start looking at uh, obviously where the, um, the trend is. So right here, I can just see that's a short term trend to the downside. So I'm just going to start drawing um, from the, these tops, declining tops. All righty, let's make this darker. I don't need an arrow. All right, so there is a declining tops trend line. The intraday high today hasn't actually gotten up to it. So, uh, you know, sometimes that will happen, sometimes it will not. For me, when I see uh, price get almost up to a trend line and then fail, um, I find that a little bit more bearish because it didn't even get up to, to test the top of that um, declining trend. Uh, and then we want to, so why, why do we only do declining tops and not uh, declining bottoms? Well, we do, of course, when we make channels. But how, how is this really helpful? Think about it. We're going down. We're getting further and lower and lower. It, it, and this trend line can go forever. It's not telling us anything. It's not telling us about the trend. What's telling us where we want is breakouts, breakdowns. We're never really going to get a quote unquote breakdown out of this um, you know, declining bottoms trend line. So you want to see, think about it. We've got a declining trend. What do we want to see happen? We want it to change into a rising trend. And how does that happen? You go with the, you get a breakout on the upside and that's telling you the trend is changing. This won't tell you that if you do declining bottoms. However, we can cheat a little bit here. When you're drawing trend channels, and this is the easiest way is you select it and you hold down, I know it's on the Apple it's the command key, I'm not sure what it is on a PC, but you select it and then you hold down that key and then it'll bring you the same line at the same angle and then you can see if there's a trend channel going on here. I don't see one. I suppose if you wanted to, to make that one, I, I wouldn't just because it's just not, to, uh, you've got too many breakdowns below this, uh, this channel here. So I wouldn't look at this as a trading channel. So let's go ahead and take that one out. Uh, so declining tops, the other one of course is rising bottoms. And again, you're measuring, you're measuring a trend that's moving upward. And you can't measure that with rising tops. I mean, you just, it, it's going to be, you're not, you know, there's no way again to, to really see the breakdown of that rising trend until it goes down below when it breaks down below that uh, rising trend. So uh, that's what we'll, we would look for. And it's this one in particular was pretty easy to spot. Um, you know, we've, we've got these uh, rising bottoms and I will go ahead and let's see if this is a trend channel. I think it might be right there. It touches these two tops. So in a, you have a rising trend. Of course, it's in a very wide channel, uh, meaning you could still ex uh, experience a lot of volatility, even if you stay in that rising trend. All right. So those are trend lines. Let's go ahead and we're going to move on and talk about moving averages. So there are three types. Uh, I did, I've done a bunch of these um, uh, workshops and I've done one on moving averages. I've done one on volume. I've done a lot of them. So I, I kind of pulled from all of them. So it might feel a little bit disjointed, but if you want to learn more about any of these concepts, you'll want to go try and find those workshops. All right. So there's three types of moving averages, basically your simple moving average, your exponential and a weighted moving average, depending on what you want to see, uh, that helps you determine which one you want to use. Uh, the simple moving average, of course, is just what you learned in school. Um, you know, take all of the uh, the uh, members, add them together, and then the number of them you divide it by. 
Uh, the exponential moving average is a little different because you're going to start with a simple moving average. And then you calculate a multiplier. I'm not going to go through this formula. It is in chart school. And then from that weighted multiplier, you can put that. That's how you would create the um, EMA using that weight. Uh, and it's typically based on, of course, your the time frame. Is it a 20-day EMA? Then your weight multiplier is going to have to do with uh, 20 days. Uh, the weighted mover, moving average, and not many people do these, uh, but you can weight them in different ways. So, for example, um, a volume weighted moving average is going to take the volume into account when it's calculating that average. Not typically what we see. Uh, triangular, you're going to you're going to um, put more weight on the more on the middle data. With the EMAs, you're concentrating more on the you're concentrating more on what the information is in the shorter term. Uh, you want to know what is happening on your average. You want to put more weight on the front, on the, um, the I guess you could call it the back end of the data, uh, the front end. Because you're, you want to know more about with your averages. You want it to react uh, more quickly um, with with price. Uh, so you're going to see a difference in the simple and exponential. For decision point, we use exponential moving averages, mainly because we do want to concentrate a little bit more on the recent data, uh, because we use our EMAs for our trend model signals. And that's basically just crossovers of these moving averages. Um, so uh, again, a lot of people use simple moving averages. I know Mary Ellen prefers those because that's typically what your big money managers are watching. Uh, and so she, she likes to watch those. Again, I use it because I use the others because it, it fits with my um, signals for decision point. All right, let's see. So we've looked at the trend lines. Uh, I didn't show you there is also an interior trend line that you can do. And I'll just, let's see, we'll make this really big and we're going to make it red. An interior one is if you're just like, remember we couldn't make a trend channel over here, but what we could do is have an interior trend line drawn kind of through the middle of what's going on here. And that, that just tells me that there is a declining trend. Um, you know, a lot of people will draw these. I don't use them very often at all, but you can draw those in there if you're just wondering, you know, if you want to look at just the trend in general and the angle, uh, because maybe it's a little different than those tops. Because like right here, I would say this is more of the angle of that trend right in through here. So the rising, the, the declining tops don't really help us out there. All right, and we looked at trend channels and we looked at support and resistance. So now we're going to go uh, and look at bullish chart patterns. We're going to move into the chart pattern arena. And again, I love these. I could spend uh, two hours on chart patterns, probably more, because I just love them. Uh, we'll go over the ascending and symmetrical triangle. That is a bullish chart pattern. We'll be going over a bull flag, which is a bullish chart pattern, a descending wedge and double triple bottoms the rectangle uh, also can be considered that i did like i said i did a trading chart patterns workshop uh, on market watchers live it was july 3rd of uh, this year so if you go back there you can see that um, that video of my chart patterns so uh, and then there's the bearish ones and i know this is pretty much fire hose descending triangles rising wedges a bear flag double and triple tops head and shoulders that was uh what somebody asked me specifically about and the bear flag so those are the the chart chart patterns i want to look at right now and i actually have some of those charts from a previous workshop that i did so I have all of these different kinds in this chart list. I, I suppose I hate to offer it up because I know what happened to, uh, to Tom when he offered his up, but I could certainly share this chart list with you, but you would have to send me an email so I can send it to you. 
Okay, where did my cursor go? That's weird. All right, so let's go ahead and I'm going to look at um, just a few of these because we just don't have, I'm going to, I'm going to concentrate. A lot of the ones we see typically are these flags. So we're going to look at a flag. Here's a bull flag formation. Let's go ahead and look at that. Okay. I have no idea where my cursor went. So um, just uh, be patient here. Let me see if I can find one here. Give me a moment. Okay, there we are. I have it back. All right. So uh, fl bull flags, I mean, that's what we call them is bull and bear flags typically. So the bull flag is upright and the bear flag is descending, of course. Uh, so you have, you measure, you get measurements. Uh, that's the part of the chart patterns that I love. So you can get measurements from these. Uh, like I said, the flag pattern is pretty obvious. I mean, it looks just like a flag. You get a breakout from a, a bull flag. You can expect a move the size of that flagpole. So that's what you're looking for. Um, so if you see here, the minimum upside target out of this flag formation was way up here. Uh, obviously, we failed to get there. But when we came back down and had that rounded bottom, we did end up coming up at, right at that upside target. Just took a little bit longer. All right, so that is the bull flag. Let's see, a bear flag. Again, I only have so much time here, so. Uh, same deal, there's the reverse of that flag. Um, I took a measurement of the flagpole. Uh, this looks like it got a little bit um, mixed up just because of the time change uh, on the pattern, but that's the basic bull flag or bear flag. Again, length of the flagpole. If you get the breakdown, that's how far you should expect price to move down. Looks like we came very close to making that um, target on that downside target. All right. Head and shoulders. We'll look at that because that's the one everybody is always interested in. All right. So here's a head and shoulders pattern. And it really, it just looks like a head with two shoulders, left shoulder, right shoulder. Now there's a lot of interesting information about volume patterns and how you do that, but I'm not gonna get into that because we're already very short on time. So the it looks like a head and it looks like shoulders and it's this chart pattern, you should expect a breakdown below what the neckline is considered here. And then you can measure the pattern and it, and add that to the bottom and that's your target. Well, we didn't actually get to it, did we? But we did get quite a breakdown. So, you know, you even can see possibly a, a bear flag that was forming, uh, but that didn't come to fruition. They don't always come to fruition, but they do give you kind of a basic idea of, uh, you know, what to possibly expect based on that pattern. All right, we're gonna look at volume real quick. I think we're almost there. All right. Uh, so here is the definition of volume. Of course, it's the action between two individuals, somebody's selling and somebody's buying the share. And the number of shares or contracts that we trade in the day is the volume. So it, uh, it really is a reflection of, you know, your finance, not just financial involvement, but emotional involvement. How many people were just had to sell today? How many people just had to buy today? It tells you a lot about the psychology. And there's a couple of different uh, indicators. I typically use the on balance volume, uh, but there are also various others. And again, you can find these in chart school. And let's just go to, uh, let's look at uh, the SPY. All right, so this is the OBV. I lost my cursor again. All right, there you go. So this is the OBV, and basically it's just a measurement of volume every day. Um, if you look at the amount of volume, and if it's a down day, you subtract it from the current uh, value, current reading. If it's an up day, the amount of that volume you add to yesterday's reading. And really it can just give you a, a sense of you know, which direction is volume, which, which direction is the, um, you know, the emotions going. All right. We've got one more I'm going to cover here. And that is momentum. 
that is the analysis of price changes instead of levels. So you're actually looking at the differences in price. And from that, you can calculate the speed or acceleration, the movement, the rate of descent. Uh, very syn it's synony synonymous with a slope. Uh, it's a rate of change. Uh, kind of indicator. Uh, these are leading, okay, leading versus lagging moving averages. Typically, you're going to see momentum indicators be a bit more leading than lagging, like moving averages are. All right. And there are a few uh, different um, indicators out there uh, for momentum. Uh, the MACD PPO, so this is moving average convergence, divergence, uh, the price percentage. Uh, <laughs> The PMO somehow got uh, written over there. I don't know how that happened, a uh, little bug, but the price, uh, the PMO is also a momentum indicator and that is uh, a decision point one. So I'll just show you a quick chart and then I'll give you the summary and we'll move along. I, I think I will do uh, at least another one and maybe um, build on some of these these concepts a little bit more because I know this is pretty fire hose, but hopefully it's giving the beginners out there uh, an idea of kind of what we do and what we're looking at and why. So on the chart here with the SPY, you can see that we have our price patterns obviously up here. Uh, this is my momentum indicator. So when it's moving down, that's telling me price momentum and acceleration is moving down. If it starts rising, that means, of course, acceleration is moving up. Um, buy sell signals are just determined by crossovers. An upside cro crossover is a buy, downside is a sell. Uh, so you can watch the rising bottoms and see if they match price bottoms. That's when you get into those divergences and convergences, but we're not going to talk about that today. That'll be my tease. We have to do that next time. All righty. So uh, the only other one I didn't cover is the scooter. That's the stock charts technical rank, and I like to have this on there. I, I recommend you go check out Chart School so you can see how it's calculated. I use it to determine whether there's internal strength or relative strength, because it does tell you by its uh, what the score is, not only how much internal strength it has, but also where it lines up among its peers. So that's the other reason I use it. So let's take a summary right now, and then we'll go ahead and look at the And then we'll look at uh, the the uh, poll. So I really I covered price bars and timeframes. And again, I know I did this really fast. We looked at moving averages. We looked at how to draw a support or resistance line and trend lines. We looked at a few price patterns. And obviously, there are plenty more out there. And then I showed you some of the basic indicators: uh, moving averages, momentum. We also looked at volume. Uh, so that, that pretty much concludes my building blocks of technical analysis. Uh, like I said, I hope it helped some of those beginners out there. Recommend, like I said, if you have somebody who's been interested in it, kind of wonders what you do. Um, you know, a lot of times spouses, I know my husband is interested. Uh, that's one way to do it too, is they can sit down and I hopefully gave enough information just to give them a taste. All right, so looking at that poll. I think that's interesting. I am, first of all, pleased to see that those less than a year are out there, that they're interested in trying to learn about this. And I feel like if you add that to the one to five years, that's yeah, 47%. We're looking at about half our audience that probably did get a little bit of uh, information out of some of these basics, uh, you know, because for me, obviously 10 plus years for you, 10 plus years it gets to be second nature. And so I, a lot of times, forget that it isn't second nature to everybody else, so. Yeah, and I would also add, I know, um, you know, I've been trying to get my, my kids a little bit more involved in this, and I would recommend that everybody out there, you know, if you've got kids or grandkids, um, you know, it probably wouldn't be a bad conversation to have when you're around them, just letting them know, letting them know how important it is um, to their fin financial future to be able to look at their investments. Um, you know, you don't need a PhD in economics. Uh, you don't have to be a CPA. Uh, a lot of these, um, you know, it takes training, it takes experience, but anyone can learn to visualize what's going on in these charts and be able to make some pretty good financial decisions, certainly better than um, 
if you don't have this right. background and information and so forth. So, you know, I think stock charts provide some great tools, um, some great learning tools, and then also obviously the annotations and being able to, you know, save charts and chart lists and that sort of thing. But with all the commentary, the education on the website, the, many of the topics that we cover, you know, I don't know somebody coming right out of high school is going to obviously pick up some of this, but I, I do think if, you know, you begin, I was actually talking to somebody in Starbucks about this the other day. It was funny because you mentioned at the hockey game, somebody coming up with a, uh, the questions for topic. me. Yeah. A topic for you on your workshop. And I was doing the same thing. I was talking to somebody and they said they had four or actually six uh, girls, six young girls or younger girls starting at age 16 and below. And they were trying to figure out what to do. And I said, well, you know, too much. This is a lot of this is going to be well over their head, but you know, you certainly could start buying a share of stock or a couple shares of stock of different companies and explain to them, you know, why these stocks are going up, you know, about their sectors or about the overall market, blah, blah, blah. And it's just a way to kind of get them going and get them interested in tech. Right. Because it's I think so funny that you mentioned that too, because um, my eldest daughter, uh, she's 26 now. She started using this app, you know, where you can put just a couple of dollars in and then they buy it, the shares for you, but you still get to pick, you know, which ETFs. And she showed me, she's like, mom, tell me what these are. Tell me what these mean. And so I would tell her, okay, but now we, this is what it is. Now we should go look at a chart. And then I explained it as I was doing the chart. I know I wrote about it uh, just, oh gosh, a month ago. My nine-year-old nephew uh, sends me a text. He wants to know uh, if I can uh, tell him about the chart for Nestle. <laughs> so I sent him a picture of a chart with trend lines and all of that. So, I mean, it's, I don't know, it's not too young to learn. And it's nice to see some interest in what I actually do as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely uh, a lot that, that kids obviously can learn. I mean, I wish, you know, if I could go back 40 years and uh, shouldn't give, be giving away my age at this point, but <laughs> if I could go back a long time and uh, and know a lot of the things or begin to learn a lot of the things that I know now, I think it would have been so much more helpful. And I think it would really help, uh, like I said, kids and grandkids alike um, to at least get them started in thinking about something like this. So it can make a big difference in their future. Right. Uh, yeah. And somebody just said, my five-year-old can tell me if the chart is up or down. Train <laughs> early, train often. <laughs> I have great. to think of Grayson Rose. Yes. <laughs> Or Warren Buffett. You know, I mean, Warren Buffett was, uh, you know, not so much technical analysis, but he was getting very involved at a young age and learned a lot before he ever went to school, you know, for any kind of training. So, yeah. Oh, Anyhow. what's your favorite chart pattern? Somebody asked. Mine? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I like bullish environments. I like low volatility environments. And within that, I like any kind of continuation pattern. I would say probably an ascending triangle. Mm -hmm. um, would certainly be one cup handle um right you know those types of continuation patterns that i can see because not only do i see the breakout and the pullbacks in those patterns where i can buy but when you see a pattern a continuation pattern then it at least gives you an idea of a target price basically. exactly yep exactly yeah i think my favorite would probably be oh gosh that's so hard because i love them all i you know honestly i'd say the double uh bottoms and double tops, triple bottoms, triple tops, because I think those are pretty, they're fairly accurate. Of course, a double bottom can turn into a, a, a double top, triple top, <laughs> triple yeah. bottom as it goes along. But um, yeah. So, All right. Well, we better get rolling here. Oh, uh, I know. We got to 10 and 10. So do you have an RRG for everyone or are we jumping right in? Oh, well, yeah, no, I don't. But I, I am going to put in the rest of these symbols uh, that came in while I was talking. And okay then I will start picking for you. But yes, the first one is UNG. And everybody vote because the most popular uh, symbol request will be the next symbol. All right, yeah, I just, uh, I didn't think you had the RRG, but I, you know, <laughs> could be a magician <laughs> in the background somehow putting together an RRG while you're giving a workshop. I, I'm that. good, but I'm, I'm not that good. <laughs> All right, we got UNG. And you know, I remember Aaron, we were talking about this one a month or so ago and the stock was literally moving up parabolic parabolically it was 22 23 back in september and it got up close to 40 in less than two months 
And I remember talking about this and we had gone up against some key resistance areas where we, you can see we had, we had dropped back to about 38. We bounced up to 41 and then we broke down below that 38 level. And if you notice each time we've gotten up to about 38, 39, we haven't been able to sustain a close above that level. We just did it again. So that's why, you know, you were just talking about the basics of price support and resistance. This is a perfect example. You look back on the chart, you see all these multiple levels or a one level, multiple tests though along that level. And you know, as you get up there, that's a level you should be watching and considering selling um, as you hit a key area like that, especially when you're talking about a two year or two and a half, three year type of a resistance level like this. So we pulled back. Um, I think that this rising 20 week moving average now is going to be pretty critical. I like the test, the move below the 20 week and the, the uh, pushback up above it. So I actually like this a lot better now than I would have or than I did uh, five or six weeks ago when we were up against this resistance. I think pulling back and hitting a, a key moving average like this is pretty uh, solid technical evidence of uh, perhaps a bounce underway. So I would be using maybe about 29 uh, your 20 week moving average is at 29.21. I think a close below that I'd watch for. That would be my downside stop. And then to the upside, I think we have a, sh a shot here now to run back up toward the upper 30. So I would be somewhat bullish UNG here. All righty. The most popular in the chat room, let's take a peek, is Square. All right. Let's take a look at Square. And I'm going to try and really step the pace up here. Uh, just so that we can get through these because I know it already is one o'clock Eastern. Um, yeah, I don't really like what's going on here. This is a high growth company. And if we are going into a bear market, which it certainly seems like we are, these types of stocks are ones that get hit really hard because their profits, they're, they're built, their valuations are built on um, continuing some very strong growth. And in a bear market, uh, you don't generally see a whole lot of growth, especially if we go into a recession. So a lot of these uh, these stocks that have been such big movers to the upside do suffer quite a bit during a bear market. And I think that's pretty evident here with this downtrend line on Square. So what I would be watching for is the support level. That was, you could call this maybe an exhaustive move to the downside. I think we are squeezing now between this area of support and the trend line above. I would watch it. We're sitting in the middle of it. I don't think there's a play here, but I do think the overall trend right now is down on Square. Okay. The next one I'm going to give to you is uh, consumer staple, uh, Revlon, REV. I guess technically I should have said that the trend was squarely lower. <laughs> no, I'm glad you didn't. <laughs> All right. Uh, Revlon, I think, is okay so far. Um, yeah, it's been weakening, but the volume's been much lighter than it was on the way up. I think there's a lot of uh, um, jockeying, manipulation, uh, consolidating, basing, all of that going on in the stock. So what I would be watching for here is uh, I want to see trend line support hold. So let's get the uh, trend line drawn in here first. And that's going to be something like that. Um, but I even think below that, I think your gap support is probably the most critical. So here was your gap up, very heavy volume on this move to the upside. A lot of folks jumping in. We've come all the way back down, didn't quite get to that gap support level. So I think we got a little bit of room potentially to the downside. If I was in, if I like the stock and I wanted to build a position, I think uh, 23 and a quarter would be a first entry, maybe 22 second entry, kind of average your way into about 2260 or so. And then I would keep a fairly tight stop below the 2175 area. Maybe if you really wanted to give it some room, this low down here around 21. But my target would be all the way up here, close to 29. Um, now, there are many stocks, even in a bear market, that do move higher. You get some of these consumer staple stocks. These are the types of stocks that are more capable of doing it. So I think the chart right now still looks pretty good. Don't like the overall market. So I'd probably wait and see if I get cheaper prices. But I think the pattern here still is fine. All right. Let's see. Uh, the next one I'm going to give you is AJRD, Aerojet Rockentine. Yeah, this is a defense stock that I think is looking pretty good. Uh, nice breakout above that prior high. So I think, again, you've got a really nice uh, trend in play here to the upside. What I would be watching, I talk about this all the time, big gap up here, really nice hollow candle. That tells me there's tremendous amount of demand for the stock. You can see over the next few days, it goes straight up, 
with he heavier than normal volume. And when we come back down, we don't fill the gap. We go to the top of the gap, and that is it. Look where that low came down to before we moved higher. So I would be trading this range, uh, 32 and a half up to just slightly above or right about that 39 level. All right. I don't, did you talk about Micron earlier? Uh, they report after the bell today. Okay. Uh, I did talk about it, but I can annotate if you want. Well, I have plenty of choices. Are you kidding? Uh, how about uh, ABT, Abbott Labs? Okay, Abbott. Uh, another one that's in the pharma space. This is a group that's been pretty strong. Um, if I was trading on the long side, it wouldn't be those high growth companies. It would be you know, many more of these defensive type stocks that do better in weak markets. And so I think it's pretty obvious. I'll try and get a line that comes in here. I think if you take a look at all these lows, you were talking about trend lines earlier. You got multiple tests along this trend line, which I think really creates a little bit more bullishness based on the fact that uh, it's held so many times. And then you've got uh, closing support, intraday support down around 68, 69. Recent high, 74, could go all the way up here to the 75 area. So yeah, 68, 69, I'd be a buyer, tight stop, and look for a 74, 75 target. All right. Let's see. Next one I'll give you is SGH, Smart Global Holdings, a semiconductor. SG, oh, H, SGH. Yep. I typed it in wrong. Since we're not doing it. Micron, we can do this semiconductor. <laughs> yeah. Um, downtrend, volume. I mean, we did get a gap up, but it's in a downtrend. Really struggled to get through that earlier resistance. I think 34, 35 is pretty big resistance now on this stock. Um, so I would I would put that in. So that was the prior high here. You can see almost got there previously in July. This is where all the heavy volume um, failed. We went back down to these lows. So we seem to be in this range. Now I'll, I'll put a second resistance level in here because on this buying of over 7 million intraday, we got up to about 35. And you can see that's right where we failed here. So all the sellers came in on that heavy volume day at 35. They also came in again on this move back to the upside. So this is the trading range. We're coming off of a downtrend. I don't like it, especially again, if we're into a, heading into a bear market, I suspect there's probably a pretty good chance we break down out of this pattern. So I would tend to be a seller in the upper end of this range and a buyer uh, at the bottom end if I was gonna buy it all. Okay, let's see the next one, uh, Canopy Growth. We haven't talked uh, about uh, weed for a while. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, um, yeah, not liking the action here, getting up to the 20 and failing. I think we're just going to you know, meander probably back down to the bottom of this key gap support area right here. And it's price support right there. You can see gap support. That's where we opened the next day. We gapped up from this level, 24 and a half. You can see that was a low there. Here was gap uh, support from this gap up back in mid-May when the volume picked up a little bit. So there's multiple reasons why the 24 and a half level uh, looks to me to be a key area where we're probably going to head back to. And I don't like when you're trending lower and you go up and you hit the, these 20 day, uh, the 20 day EMA resistance and fail. That to me is a sign of a stock that is trending lower. So I think unless it can hold on to the recent gap support right in here, uh, maybe even like right there, 20, uh, 27.75 to maybe 28 and a quarter. That needs to hold to the downside. If it doesn't, then I think we go back down to 24 and a half. Okay. Uh, next one I'm going to do from the materials sector, BHP Billiton. So BHP. Right. BHP uh, just sideways consolidating. I mean, obviously the stock has performed better than the S&P 500 of late. Uh, in December, we're actually higher when the S&P has gone much lower and you can see the volume really coming in. So I've got to say that this is a stock that certainly looks better than most stocks out there, but from a pure technical perspective, I don't see a reason to buy here if I'm trying to manage my risk. So there's your kind of your wider uh, trading range that the stock has been in for many months, most of 2018. And as we pull back down closer to the 43 and a half, 44 area, I would like it closer to the 51 area, I'd sell it. And we're right in the middle of the range right now. So it's just something I'd, I'd keep an eye on, but I wouldn't trade it here. Okay, let's do um, SCI Service Corp. 
All right. Um, well, I mean, it should have held this prior support level, putting in higher highs, higher lows. That support should have held that didn't, which tells me we're probably going to go back and test this 41 area. So I'm going to draw that support in right here. That was the low we saw in early September. Again, we gapped down very heavy volume, but we managed to come back up and close at about 4080. And then we rallied off of it. Here was the short term support that I would have been looking to hold. We didn't. We moved down on just kind of average volume, but I would be now looking at um, a trading range and I'm, I would go all the way up to the declining 20 day. I think it's possible we could go up to the 20 day and then to the downside, I would be watching the uh, support level, which for me would be that prior area around 40, 80. So I think this is about a three, three and a half dollar trading range. We're again, sitting pretty close to the middle of it. I would pass. I don't see a trade here right now. Okay, and our last one uh, from financials, Goldman Sachs. I believe they were in the news today. I can't remember why, but. Um, yeah, they've got, uh, I think, uh, a government that's all over them uh, for criminal, potential criminal activity. And you can see a lot of folks bailing. I think it may have been Malaysia. Um, but anyway, here was a big move down from 230 all the way down into the 160s. Uh, really broken stock. I, there's not much here other than maybe an oversold bounce that I'd be looking for. But this is a stock where you were seeing a lot of distribution. That was the big breakout. I don't think we'll go all the way back up there. Again, I think this is a situation where you've got a stock that is broken, trending lower. You can see the PPO accelerating to the downside. So therefore, first test of that 20-day moving average, I would be a seller. So I don't like Goldman Sachs here. All right. Uh, let's see. Um how about that it? that's it yes oh my gosh i'm trying to pick more <laughs> i know everybody would have probably loved to see more uh because they do like this segment uh, those are the symbols that we went over today tom annotated just go to the blogs tab click on the market watchers live blog and the link to those charts exactly as you just saw them are in that market watchers live chart list so i'll have these up uh shortly after the program all right, time for our final market update. What has been going on while we have been having fun? All right, here we go. Okay, uh, looks like the markets, you know, they, they were up, but now we're just sort of meandering sideways uh, with the exception, I'd say, of the Canadian markets, which they did their little bit of meandering, but they're, they're already starting back up in a nice rising trend. Uh, Treasury yields are falling again today, uh, right now at 2.832%. The VIX is up. Uh, to 24.87, so it is elevated. We've got the uh, UUP mostly unchanged really at this point, reading 25.97. Gold is up though, uh, 24 cents for a GLD at 118.11. We can see USO just another down bad day. Could be even forming an intraday reverse flag like I talked about. Uh, now you're looking at TLT, and that could al almost be a bull flag going on intraday, but it did move up. Uh, looked like we were going to pull back there, but still, it looks like it's going to take back off again. Currently, it's reading at 119.50. And that's all I had for my portion of the market update. What you got for us, Tom? All right. Yeah, I just wanted to show short term. I mean, now that the S&P 500 is down below that 2581 closing support level, that to me is going to be an initial area of resistance, 2581. And if you look at the 20 hour EMA, we're at 2586 and declining. So I think the first really big test for the market is going to be that 2581 level and this declining 20 day EM, or excuse me, 20 hour EMA, which are almost the same level go going to be as we move uh, later into the day. So that's going to be the first test. Now, if we get above it, doesn't mean that oh. Uh, corrections over and we're back into the bull market. Obviously, there's a lot of technical damage on longer term charts, a lot of overhead resistance that would have to be negotiated. I'm just talking really from a very, very short term perspective. I know from looking back, I mean, you can see here on the big move down in earlier, uh, earlier back in December on the 6th, we gapped down. Notice where we failed. It was at a gap resistance and that 20 hour EMA that was declining before we started moving lower again. When we rally, a lot of times you'll see that rising 20 hour hold. So this is just a very, very short term initial uh, resistance area. 
but I'm going to be watching 2581 to about 2585 if we get a little bit of, of strength later today. The other thing to keep an eye on, when we sell off, we tend to sell off in the afternoons. So if we do get that move up, watch the final hour to see if maybe we start to roll back over. I think that could give us signals as we head into that Fed meeting tomorrow. Okay, uh, that is it. Um, I guess it is time to roll over into that final segment um, where we are going to look at stocks to watch. Well, I'm gonna look at stocks to watch. And I thought what I would do today uh, for this segment is I pulled up the longer term chart for the uh, Dow Jones. And we talked about the S&P 500 falling below and losing support. But when we look at this weekly, or excuse me, daily chart on the Dow, you can see we actually closed at 23.5 back in March. And we've had a lot of these tests around 23.5, including yesterday's test, where we went just below 23.5 and then we held on the close. So yes, the S&P broke down. We've seen a lot of breakdowns in many different areas of the market. The Dow Jones held. And I was thinking about it and I said, well, why don't we take a look at this kind of like we would look at a political race? Um, and so, you know, with uh, the, the presidential election, we have 50 states and we're looking at uh, we have these swing states. We call them these swing states where we know certain states are going to go a certain direction. Other states are going to go a certain direction. It really is dependent on these swing states. And I thought when I was looking at the Dow uh, components, I saw stocks that I think were clearly bullish stocks. I saw stocks that were clearly bearish stocks. And I see stocks that are swing stocks in the Dow that I think are going to determine whether or not we break down or not. So let's start off. I'm going to pull up these uh, bearish charts first and just kind of go through uh, these stocks. I'm going to go through a bunch of I'm going to try and get through all 30 components here in about eight or nine minutes. So we'll see if we can get through pretty quickly. But here are the bearish stocks. I don't think there's any doubt right now that ExxonMobil is in a downtrend. We have upcoming support around 70, but I don't see a whole lot holding this stock right now. WBA, this is Walgreens Boots Alliance. Big move up, looked really good, but look at the negative divergence, higher price, lower PPO, and then the breakdown with volume accelerating. I think that this was a really look good looking chart uh, just a few days ago. But I think this heavy volume move back below the key moving averages going into negative territory on the PPO, I think this one has turned bearish. UTX, United Technologies, definitely a downtrend. We do have a support level we're trying to deal with now around 115, but I don't think there's any doubt. Look at the volume coming in on this recent selling. I think we've got a bearish looking chart. IBM, uh, IBM, big ski slope of a drop to the downside, sideways action in a flag. I don't think I really need to spend much time here. JNJ, after the uh, whole thing came up with asbestos in baby powder, uh, at the end of last week, you can see the massive selling that took place. Maybe we'll see Johnson & Johnson right the ship back to the upside. But for now, when you see a stock move with its PPO right through centerline support, we give up price trend line, moving average support on this kind of volume, I think you got to say now it is in a more bearish pattern for sure. JP Morgan, uh, hard to argue bullish when you're losing support that we had throughout 2018. Obviously, banks um, waiting to see what the Fed has to say. Apple, this is one that maybe you could argue, well, we had such a big move up. This is just something that we needed and we're going to come back down to support. Some might say that this isn't necessarily bearish. I don't know. I look at the volume and I see this move to the downside. Can't even test its de its declining 20-day moving average. Suppliers coming out talking about the reduced orders. Uh, I can't really see anything I like here at, on Apple. I'd say this is a bearish stock. Uh, Chevron, CVX. CVX really topped back in uh, January, has not been able to take that out. Even though we've seen the market, the overall market move higher, it is in that oil space. It looks better than Exxon. That's not saying a whole lot. I don't like CVX here. DWDP, this is Dow DuPont. And Dow DuPont looking a lot like IBM's chart. Straight down, got a little bit of a bounce. 60 is going to be a big area now to try to get through. Was support from back in March, April. Broke down, that becomes resistance. Couldn't get through. Now we're challenging the low end. Off of a downtrend, I see a bear flag. Not liking it. Goldman Sachs just talked about. Huge move down. Uh, certainly not looking very good. Home Depot, home improvements, wasn't looking bad in September. Now, all of a sudden, come under a lot of pressure. 
We did have lower lows with a higher PPO, positive divergence, but what I look for is a 50 period test and a move back up close to that center line. I think we've gotten that and it now looks like we are moving back to the downside again on Home Depot. Caterpillar, uh, Caterpillar uh, off of the high back in January, really struggled to get back through about 158, 160 multiple times, then broke down below the July and August low. And you know, here we had the black candle off of an uptrend, which looked like we might be going somewhere and then quickly sellers jumped right back in again. Not really seeing it here, I'm seeing a downtrend. I think we stick with a bearish call right now on Caterpillar. Deer, pretty much the same thing. Uh, this is one where I think Deer looks a little bit better than Caterpillar, holding on to the support for May, but overall still downtrending. I don't know. This one maybe could be considered a swing stock, but I'm going to say bearish. And then uh, 3M, uh, clearly off of this high, we're way down below where we were back in January. Can't seem to get back through this area of resistance at about 215 to 217, breaking back down below the key moving averages. I see bearishness here. So what stocks are bullish? Uh, how about Disney? Disney, nice uptrend, sideways consolidation. I think as long as 108 holds, I, I would still maintain a, a bullish call here on Disney. Um, yeah, it's been weak a little bit over the last month, but I think overall what we're seeing is a stock putting in higher highs and higher lows. McDonald's. McDonald's, I think, is clearly bullish, although uh, on the top, higher prices, lower PPO that normally uh, we see after that is a centerline test and a 50 period test. We're getting close. I think I'm OK with McDonald's as long as it holds about 177 and a half, 178 in that area. Let's go to Coke, Coca-Cola, KO. Another one, big move up, broke out on a closing basis with a negative divergence. Very similar to what we were just looking at on McDonald's. I think it's fine as long as it holds on to the 50 day for sure. I would even give this one down to that January high, which would be around 47. So I'd give Coke a little bit of room, but I think this is one clearly in a nice uptrend. Merck, MRK, Pharma's, look at this uptrend. Looks really nice to me. Can't really argue here. I think that's a nice uptrend in play. Uh, Pfizer, another one in that pharma space, just recently broke out to begin December. Yes, it's getting hit with the overall market pulling back, but I think as long as it holds these lows, I'm going to say 41 to 42. Pretty good support on Pfizer. I think this one remains pretty bullish. Procter & Gamble in the consumer st uh, staples area broke out above the highs that we saw in 2017. I, the only problem here I see is higher prices, lower PPO. Failing to hold this 20-day, I think we're going to move back down to the lower 90s, maybe around 90. But I still think the overall uptrend is in play here. And then uh, Cisco. Cisco, I think, is the last of the bullish stocks. Higher highs, higher lows, pullback and gap support between 43 and a half, 44, continuing to hold. I think as long as that holds, I'd be bullish Cisco. So now let's move on to the swing stocks. These are the ones I think that are going to make a difference. Are we trending higher? Are we trending lower? Definitely we are trending lower, but we have gone back down to this 120 level on multiple occasions and we have held. We are back down there again. Um, the reason to me it's a swing stock, I think in the last couple of times when we moved higher, I'm seeing volume increase. So I think there's some accumulation taking place on travelers at this point. So if we were to go back down and break below those support levels, then I think we got problems. Until then, I'm gonna say this is a swing stock. AXP, American Express. Nice move, breakout, but we have come back down below the moving averages. We've done it on volume, but so far we're holding support. Higher highs, higher low, higher high, still that low is holding. Uh, not looking good. I don't want to say that this is an overly bullish stock, but we haven't broken down. Swing stock. Microsoft. Microsoft, big move up. One of the better stocks in software continues to hold well. You can make a lot of arguments. This was a stock that continued going up throughout 2018, outperforming. The first time it pulled back uh, significantly here, we got down to about 100. We've been holding. I think we're just simply consolidating. I look at this as a pretty bullish stock, but a lot of volume on the selling. And can we hold? We're back below these moving averages. I think Microsoft's going to be a swing stock. Are we in a bear market? Are we in a uh, correction? These swing stocks, I think, are going to make the difference on the Dow. Next up, Boeing. Uh, Boeing went below this prior low, but look at that hollow candle off of this downtrend. That could be an exhaustive um, 
uh, gap to the downside. Really nice recovery on good volume. I think 390 is your resistance. 300 to 310 is your support. I'm waiting to see which way Boeing goes here. I think this is a swing stock. Intel, I was on the fence, uh, putting it in the bearish side because it was downtrending. But this is another one where I think the volume trends have started to turn a little bit. We had this little head fake taking out the prior high, and now we're simply consolidating. I'm going to say this is in a very narrow 46 to 50 range. Let's see where it breaks out. I think this is a swing stock. Nike, NKE, we just got a few more here. Nike <clears throat> broke down, but notice gap support over here at about 70, just above 70. And that's where we've been holding. We keep rallying back up above 78, 79. You know, parts of this chart tell me to throw it in the bearish camp. And another part says, well, we haven't lost this key support area. You can see a triple top breakout around 70, just below 70. That's been holding. I say Nike is a swing stock. UNH, United Health. Two or three weeks ago, I would have said this is a, a bullish chart. Probably could still throw it in the bullish camp but the volume is concerning me on this move to the downside. Let's see if it holds 252 to 254. We're at 255 right now, swing stock. Visa, V, very similar, nice move up. This one looks a lot like Microsoft and some others where really when the overall market turned lower, we saw weakness. But so far, that initial big move to the downside is holding, um, and that was support back in June. So I'm gonna say Visa swing stock, if it holds 130, I think that's bullish. If it doesn't, then we're in trouble. And the last one is Verizon. Verizon, I'm saying, is a swing stock. It broke below the moving averages. It had been pretty bullish, but it did on the last high uh, up here put in a negative divergence. And do we have time? Yeah, we do. I'm going to show you something real quick on this since we've already gone over the poll. Um, if I pull up a line chart instead of a candlestick chart, I think it becomes clearer that you have a negative divergence. See the higher uh, closing price and the lower PPO? That normally results in some weakness, which is what we're seeing. If I go back to the, to the uh, candle chart, it looks like we never put in a higher high. But remember, it's based on closing prices. Sometimes candles are hard to look at and see. But we got gap support and price support on that recent low where we filled the gap at about $55. I think with that negative divergence, I was expecting the weakness. Can we hold $55? I think that puts VZ in the swing category. So let's pull up a quick summary. Uh, I did not put all these charts or all these stocks on the list. Basically, we went over every Dow Jones component, the fact that the overall Dow is very close to a key support. And the whole idea in technical analysis is how many of these stocks would you buy as a technician? How many would you sell? And if there are more that you would buy than sell, chances are the, the index is going to hold up. I think going through that list kind of tells you which stocks you really want to be focusing on to see whether or not the Dow Jones ends up breaking down. I think if those swing stocks begin to break down, I think that's going to uh, really tear into the foundation of this bull market. And uh, really, where that's going to start the, uh, the rollover from correction to bear market. All right, Aaron, we are down to our last minute. What do you think of the market here? Oh, somebody asked in the chat room, when is this bloodbath going to be over? <laughs> I think Santa Claus might give us a little bit of a respite, but uh, I, I think we've got a bear market on our hands. Yeah, I'm leaning. Well, I'm more than leaning. I'm certainly uh, just about ready to fall over in that direction. <laughs> um, I think there are still, you know, I look back to 2016 and a lot of things look very similar to now and I got very bearish and then we started taking off, but we really don't want to go much lower. I mean, we need to be turning. There's no doubt about it. Um, but as I said recently, S, uh, Santa Claus, always dressed in red. He might have a little bit more red this Christmas. <laughs> well, let's hope he brings a little green. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> anyway, I uh, want to thank everybody for attending. Uh, special thanks to Erin for her uh, technical analysis, uh, kind of a beginner's course. I think a lot of you probably got a lot out of that. Um, Want to, uh, again, thank you all for being with us. Uh, please remember to complete the survey as you exit. Uh, as a quick reminder, Market Watchers Live airs five days a week, Mondays through Fridays from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great Tuesday afternoon, everybody. Hopefully see you back here tomorrow. Happy trading.